Good morning. My name is John Gilkison, and in the 1990s, I was the vice president of a, of an energy efficiency and lighting company called uh, Negawatts Inc. Um, and in that experience, uh, I want to talk to you today um, about the Jevons paradox. Um, my association with energy issues goes way back to the early 1980s. Uh, I'm also an amateur astronomer and uh, been involved with outdoor lighting. And in 2000, uh, I was uh, instrumental in helping get the Las Cruces Outdoor Lighting Ordinance passed. Uh, I served in the committee, the ad hoc committee that wrote the ordinance and wrote quite a few editorials on it, which helped get it passed. Um, the Jevons Paradox is something I first encountered when uh, I was involved with Negawatts Inc. And I found it very concerning that essentially here was a, a, a theorem that said that uh, installed energy efficiency would not result in saving energy over the long term. That simply people would end up using more energy. So it's just something I've thought about over the last 25 years or so. And I've come to some conclusions over time. Because I found that as an individual or even an institution that you could save energy by using energy efficiency. Uh, you might do more things. Uh, energy efficiency allows us to create more wealth. So, um, But the Jevons paradox is uh, talking about society as a whole. And I've come to the conclusion that it's, it's in context with a society that is growing in an economic system, if you're embedded in an economic system that's constantly growing and the population's growing, that yes, you can save energy with individual devices, but over time, uh, the society will continue to use more energy. So, I think the Jevons paradox is often stated out of context. Um, so, Recently, I had occasion to read the the work where Jevons postulated this paradox. It's a, a book called The Coal Question, which was written in 1865. And uh, Jevons was a real booster for uh, coal and uh, steam engines, and he was really proud of the English race and so forth. He, he seemed to be an individual who wouldn't have been out of place in any modern Chamber of Commerce meeting. Um, and he liked to publish a lot of tables in his books also. And if you look over the tables in the coal question, you'll see that the population of England, even with immigration uh, out of the country, had practically doubled over the previous 60 years. Uh, from when he wrote the book, and that the economic in industry had more than doubled. And although improvements in the efficiency of boilers and steam engines had been made, uh, more coal was being burned than ever. So that's why Jevons came to his conclusions. Now Jevons... Uh, was aware of uh, crude oil, but he didn't think it would ever amount to anything. And he, he was also even aware of electric motors and the potential for electricity to be of service to mankind. But he also didn't think that would ever supplant coal and steam. So Jevons didn't seem to be any Nostradamus. Um, he wasn't a far-seeing man in that respect. However, the book is uh, very well written and uh, 
quite a work really and it's really a window into a, a different time <coughs> um, but many of the ideas in it are, are still held today by people that uh, we need more and more economic growth and a growing population uh, rising tides lift all boats and so forth and and uh, these are not new ideas um, but if we were living in a different society one where economic growth wasn't the reigning paradigm and the population was stable or being reduced uh, the Jevons paradox would not be true uh, and I think many people don't realize that the Jevons paradox is is in a in a context and that's why I wanted to make this video today um, also Jevons didn't know anything about climate change apparently uh, he didn't realize that coal uh, and CO2 emissions were going to change the climate and today we have reached such a point with uh, well over 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere that uh, we've entered a new era called uh, abrupt climate change where all the amplifying feedback loops are beginning to take off. Uh, over the last 250 years we'd raise the average temperature of the planet uh, 0.85 degrees Celsius and in just the last year we probably raised it another 0.5 degrees Celsius and that's that's called the exponential function and all this uh, CO2 is cumulative and uh, it's a ratchet effect so it stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years and the only way to really uh, get a handle on global warming would be geoengineering unfortunately uh, just cutting our emissions is not going to do it. Uh, so I like to think of the Jevons Paradox as the Jevons Paradox asteroid, which is headed straight towards Earth and uh, could mean our near-term human extinction in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, so this is the reason I've been interested in the question, and I've seen many people out there who have used the Jevons Paradox as a reason to say that energy efficiency is a waste of time and it's not it's it's one of the tools we have in our toolbox to to combat global warming but it's not the only tool um, I also ran into the Jevons paradox in in the um, Tim Garrett's work on uh, only the uh, collapse of civilization can stop global warming and he uses the Jevons paradox to talk about the futility of trying to save energy and so forth. And again, as I said, I think it's out of context. Um, so I, I, I had occasion to have some communications with Tim Garrett, and I sent him several postulates that, of uh, how we could have a stable society if our population was about one tenth as much. And we stopped using fossil fuels and we had uh, um, only renewable resources for energy and we got rid of democracy and actually instituted a form of government that could get things done and we discarded neoliberal capitalism for a, a, a static economy or a no growth economy and so forth and his response to me was that his his work was based on what was likely to happen, not what should happen. And that's fair enough, um, but uh, I think it begs the question, what should happen? I mean, if hum humanity's facing an existential crisis of extinction, uh, it's a question that I think a lot of people would like to know. What is it we could and should do to try to save ourselves and uh, humanity and the, and the rest of the planet uh, is uh, we're in, involved in the sixth great extinction so this includes a lot of uh, animals 
Uh, we can't possibly kill all life, probably bacteria and so forth will still be left, but uh, we won't be around to appreciate the fact that life goes on. Um, the last time humanity um, lived on sunshine and wind power and so forth was about the year 1800 when there was only one billion people. So that is a good frame of reference and that's why I use the uh, uh, reduce the population by 10x. Every problem we have would be uh, 10 times easier to solve if the population were reduced that much. And a lot of people will tell me that, oh, it's just not possible uh, politically or, or, or for religious reasons, uh, we'll never get involved in population control. And my answer to that's always been that uh, if we don't do it, nature's going to, and we're not going to like the way nature goes about it, because it, it will be brutal. And so I think if we're facing extinction, our leaders and, and most people would be uh, all in for some radical changes. I just don't think very many people are aware that we are facing extinction yet, or they don't believe it. And uh, so, and a lot of these other things, these things could be on the table too. Uh, I have some people tell me, well, there's not enough money to do this or that. And there's literally tens of trillions of dollars sitting in corporate coffers around the planet. And uh, the one percent uh, have about, you know, 40 percent of the wealth of the planet. And things ain't working out. We're, changes need to be made. And it's not going to do anyone any good to be filthy rich if they're, if they're not going to live the they're expect, you know, to see their life expectancy, you know, uh, make it to the end. Um, so, um, money in our economic system is literally something we invented. It's not, it's not a natural law. And economics isn't really a science. Uh, our as a species, I think one of the problems is, is although we have great intellectual capacities, our brains are simply uh, overlays of a, of a more primitive brain, which has uh, hierarchies of uh, dominance and power and and instinctual needs for you know sex, status, reproduction, so forth, and we have great abilities, but our more primitive brains are overriding it, um, which explains a lot about politics and, and other things. But if we could plumb the, as a species, if we could plumb the size of the observable universe, there's just no reason we can't solve some of these problems. Uh, we lack the collective will to, de we seem to be paralyzed, and uh, it's, uh, our great intellect is not going to do us any good if we we don't have any more capacity to make changes to uh, continue our existence than bacteria in a petri dish, who simply will continue to reproduce as the substrate is there until they foul their own nest and and all die off, and that seems to be what we're doing. So. We have this potential to be a spacefaring species, and if we go extinct, it, it, it's going to explain the paradox of the uh, of the Fermi paradox. That uh, the reason there we haven't encountered any life forms out there is they all tend to go extinct before they become spacefaring and and uh, are capable of contacting other life forms in the universe. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I've published a blog on EV World uh, concerning the Jevons uh, <coughs> Paradox Asteroid. So go check it out on EV World.